Okay, guys. Um, thank you so much for coming. We'll get started. Sorry, it's a little bit, a little bit uh, late, but we'll get started. Okay. So, welcome to Eagle Talks. Um, I want to start our start our event off by talking briefly about who we are and our history. So, Eagle Talks is a student organization dedicated to helping students be inspired and also to inspire other people with their amazing personal stories and ideas. Because we really are home to a group of amazing individuals with these amazing stories to tell. And um, our idea about Eagle Talks first started with these three EGA seniors from 2019. And in the winter of 2019, they hosted the first ever Eagle Talks themed The Strength to Overcome. And we saw how they were having these initiatives in which they shared their personal stories and shared these personal stories that wasn't really you know, being able to told if there was no platform like this. And they used this platform to connect their individual voices with the stories and eventually helping them to inspire other people at home. So although they all graduated that year, we thought that this is a mission that we can continue and we can help support. So we took over and in the winter of 2020, we hosted our first ever Eagle Talk event featuring four speakers. So down here you see Dr. Gamble, who talked about his experience traveling around the world, which is pretty similar to one of the stories you'll be hearing today. And on his right, you see Drew Sedemeyer from the class of uh, 2021, who talked about the LGBTQ experience here at Colbert and what we can do to make these people feel more included and build a more diverse and inclusive campus environment. Up there, you see Stephen Ying, who's also present today, and he talked about his experience as a student athlete and how he overcame some of the most significant injuries and obstacles he met on his athletic career. And last but not least, I had a little message I wanted to talk about on infectious disease modeling and math, so I also did an Eagle Talk myself. And then, after these four, pe four people spoke, um, we heard many good things about our event, so three months later, we hosted our second event, this time with six speakers, including Brooke McConkey, Mr. Danforth, Noah Tan, Estelle, Ali, and Jacob. And um, after this event, Eagle Talk's first year on campus came to a conclusion, and then we came back to campus this year thinking that we will be able to bring you to you guys another really great event that is inspired and that can help you to learn about amazing things and do great things with our four new individual speakers. So having learned about what Eagle Talk is and what our mission is, I will now hand our little uh, quickie thing off to our first speaker. tonight is a man who has the most intimidating figure on campus and then throws it away the moment he opens his mouth. While many of us try to balance our love of humanities in the STEM fields, he knows well where his loyalties lie, once describing math as just wannabe Greek. However, whether he's learning wannabe Greek, actual Greek, or the morals of the people who spoke it, his passion for philosophy and faith is on full display. A devout Christian, he throws himself into the studies not just of his own religion, but of all facets of spirituality from modern Islam to ancient Judaism to faiths whose final followers have long since been consigned to the annals of history. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Jack Mullins to the stage. All right, so first of all, let me start by saying I'm really happy everyone came out tonight. It's really awesome to see so many people being interested and in getting to learn more, especially from our student body. It's a great opportunity for me as a fellow student to get to share something that I'm very passionate about. Plenty of teachers have made this very apparent to me that they would love to see me talk and get information out from outside the classroom. Being able to establish connections with students outside when it comes to what I know, what I've been passionate about, what I've tried to learn for such a long time, and being able to share it with a greater culture community. So, without further ado, this is Beyond the Pew. This was an idea when I first started thinking about doing an Eagle Talk that I knew I wanted to get out there. When it came to speaking uh, and being able to think about something I was passionate about, I immediately recalled back to my faith. Plenty of teachers that have worked with me or talked with me or faculty members, even students, as Marty mentioned, know very well that 
Faith has been a huge anchor point and part of my life. I have spent multiple years learning about ancient philosophy and morality and trying to better understand what it means to be human and why we strive to do the things we do, why we try to find meaning. And today, I'm hoping to take us through an analysis of the concept of spirituality and how we apply spiritual development here at Culver. So, let's get this thing started. So, our fundamental questions start off with, what is the soul and what is spirituality? So, these are two very complex questions. When it comes to asking what a soul is, a lot of students that I've talked to, even faculty members, family members, you name it, plenty of people think that soul and spirituality dwells on the realm of the metaphysical. A lot of people tend to think that we have this very, very primal idea of the soul being an encaged life form that only leaves us upon death, that it has a journey to the afterlife, or that it has a purpose of giving us morality, but it is a caged creature that is separate from us. Tonight I want to challenge that notion. Nefesh. Nefesh is a term in ancient Hebrew and it is referred to in the Bible several times. Nefesh literally translates to the Hebrew word for throat. Now a lot of people might be thinking, Jack, why are you talking to us about anatomy? What I'm talking to you about is a concept that was founded in a language that was invented long before any of us were here, long before any of us breathed our first breath. People thought about these concepts before any of us even conceived a thought. And it all started with what ancient Israelites thought was the throat, the essence and the gateway between the outside world and the inside world. What is inside the human being travels through one orifice, in and out. The throat, the idea of the nefesh, is now translated to the word for soul. Why is this the case? This is because when we refer to nefesh, or the throat, it is where all life begins. From the moment that a baby is born to the moment that a human dies, we have a first and last breath. People who speak Hebrew understand the throat as the gateway of life, of breath. It is a gateway from the mind to the outside. When we speak, we have thoughts. When we have our thoughts, they travel out through our mouth, through the throat. This has a very significant meaning when we talk about nefesh. I want us all to understand that there is a very deep meaning when it comes to the soul. And I want to challenge this idea of it being a metaphysical essence. I want us to understand that there is more to it than that. The soul in and of itself could be referred to as the whole person. When we talk about the soul and the throat, the metaphysical and the physical, when we talk about these things, they must be one. And that is the notion that I'm trying to challenge people with today. Now, why do we want to grow spiritual? Now, spiritual growth is an inner process of removing obsolete ideas and habits, wrong concepts, and erroneous beliefs and ideas about life. So, when we grow spiritually, there's a lot more to it than just sitting down in a pew and listening to a sermon or having someone tell you to breathe in a certain way, or being able to unlock something in the metaphysical realm of our body, what we feel, our emotions. There's more to it than that. When we talk about spiritual growth, we want to understand that it's about improving the entire person. This is where the concept of the throat start of comes, it starts to come into play. We have this idea that the entire person is the spirit. The entire person is an embodiment of his thoughts, his words, and his actions. That person is completely governed by their own consciousness, their own desires, and all of this is intertwined, and to separate it would not be doing it justice. 
When we try to remove obsolete ideas and habits, wrong concepts, erroneous beliefs, and ideas about life, that is spiritual growth because it gives us the time to be one with ourselves. When people say meditate, pray, this isn't a time for us to necessarily talk to ourselves or be alone with ourselves, but rather it's a time to channel that idea of the metaphysical. It's the idea of being in solitude with one's entire person, a mixture of their thoughts, their emotions, their ability to now analyze that which they are thinking, that which they are doing, that which they are saying. It is a process of widening the horizons of your consciousness and the understanding of some inner truths. When one gives their time to meditate, one gives their time to pray, one gives their time to just analyze things that go on throughout their day. All of these things are similar, and it's a spiritual practice that can be done at any time. We need to ask ourselves these fundamental questions of who am I, what do I value, what are my gifts? Where do I fit? How do I figure out my purpose in life? All of these are questions that we should have asked ourselves. And they are important questions because they are what allow us to become more human. They are what allow us to be able to communicate better, connect better with fellow human beings. The idea of the soul is not just solitude, but also community. The idea of being able to cultivate spiritual growth does not just come from one's own ability to be one with ourselves, but also be ones with multiple people. That is the beauty of it. And I want to apply that to a lot of what we do right here on this campus. What is Culver's value to spiritual growth? Culver's mission for spiritual development it's clearly stated in the mission statement. It's been said multiple times, those three simple words, mind, spirit, body, mind, spirit, body. We want to cultivate those things. We want to be able to make students and faculty, anyone here on Culver's campus, better understand and be able to grow in these three facets of life. But Culver has a mission that it applies to it. There's more to it than just growing them. Growth has purpose. Growth has an expectation. There is an end point. We have a goal, but some of us don't always realize it. Culver educates its students for leadership and responsible citizenship in society by developing and nurturing the whole individual, the whole individual, one person. Every part, every facet comes together. Mind, spirit, body. By those, we can learn how to cultivate character. We can teach leadership. We can teach social skills. Why? Because there's more to it than just being one with oneself. It's not just me and my God, me and my spirit, me and whatever creator I assign to this world, whatever greater physical being, whatever greater meaning, there is that I associate in this life. Because ultimately that's what religion is. That's what spirituality is to most people. They think that there has to be either a ritualistic religious practice combined with an idea of metaphysical existence. But I challenge that notion for us to understand that spirit has an end goal. Spiritual growth has an end goal. We are trying to cultivate spirit and grow spirit all by cultivating one entire person in one entire community, oneness. Keep this in mind. We're going to hit on this really hard later. The whole person education cannot and will not eliminate spirit from the development process. Religious diversity allows for students to encounter people with different ideas and beliefs challenging them to think critically about their own. That is cool. That's really cool. 
How many conversations have you had on Culver's campus with other students who have had different racial, ethnic, religious backgrounds? Have you ever questioned your own beliefs before? Have you ever felt like you need to be questioned before? Do you think that's a good thing? I certainly do. I'd like to share with you really quickly a personal experience that I've had. Stephen is a lovely <laughs> roommate, pseudo roommate, I should say, because he lives right across the hall from me in our cage in our barrack. So we have our own little subsection that we live in away from the rest of all the craziness that goes on out in the hallway. We have a nice big set of wooden doors that separates us all from that. It's the two Stevens, so the Steven room, and then me and my roommate, G.R. Kilbourne. One night, I'm not even sure how late it was. It was probably 1, 2 a.m. We were just asking each other questions. We found it almost super intriguing and super like, you just couldn't get your mind off of trying to understand one, one another's viewpoint. There was so much discussion and there were so many questions and answers and firing left and right. Why do you believe this? Why do you believe that? Well, I don't know if that applies to me, but I think that I can see it. And then something clicks. Something is said that makes sense. There's a connection that's made. But we're not all Christians. We're not all Muslims. We're not all Jews. We're not all Buddhists. We're not all atheists. We all have different backgrounds. Aren't we supposed to disagree? Aren't we supposed to not, you know, agree on all the things that we're talking about when it comes to this very topic. Sure, we can be friends, but maybe I want someone who's going to help me cultivate my spirit rather than just tolerate it. No, because people can cultivate your spirit, even if they don't disagree with you. In my Culver experience, I have been here for four years and I have had some of the greatest conversations I've had with in my life because people told me word for word, God is dead. It goes against everything that I fundamentally was raised on, agreed with, and ever studied. And right then, I knew that a bond was formed. I was challenged. I had a chance to communicate with another individual about something that I thought so strongly about. Not in a demeaning way. Not a, no, you're wrong because. Not a, no, I know that I'm right because. Mm -mm. It all started with, why do you think that? hearing out other people's sides. You don't all need to have the same ideas to be able to cultivate spirit, cultivate character. People can grow by being challenged. And I would say that people grow more by being challenged. That's what Culver's all about. All the guys in the room can attest to that. The day that you first stepped on this campus, you know what I'm talking about. Challenge is growth. And as Culver students, I think it is so important for us to realize that. More on this later. Keep this in the back of your mind. What are some problems that we encounter today regarding spirituality? There is no difference between religion and spirituality if the spirit is existing. It has to be alive. Every ritual is also spiritual. But as soon as spirit is gone, that's religion, ritualistic religion. This quote comes from a well-known guru who I have ascribed to. He has a podcast, uh, Dwarf Baldas. He's spoken multiple times with different hosts uh, regarding certain philosophies and podcasts, video shows, whatever. He's talked multiple times about this idea of a very famous phrase that a lot of people talk about, the idea of being spiritual, but not religious. 
spiritual, but not religious. Now, why would one say that they are spiritual but not religious? Oh, well, I don't like the whole swing around of the incense and all the smoke going around the room and eating the cookie and drinking the red juice. You know, it's just not for me, man. Does that mean that it's not spiritual? Spiritual, but not religious. Oh, well, I don't like getting on my knees and having to pray five times a day. I think that, you know, I can still be spiritual. I can think of the metaphysical, you know, I believe in a soul, but I don't necessarily believe in a God. And that makes me not religious. Spirituality is in religion. The whole point of it being that. Because if the spirit is dead, religion serves no purpose. Religion is to cultivate, bring community to cultivation of the spirit. Because if the spirit is dead, it's just a ritual. It has no meaning. It's just work. The channeling of oneness. The bringing together of oneness in community. We go to church on Sunday to be one with others. We go to service on Thursday, Friday night to be one with the community. To grow as one. That is the purpose. One and done, once a week. This one really hits home for me because so many times will students come to me, the regimental aid to religious and spiritual life chaplain, you know, it gets thrown around. I guess no one really knows what it is at this point. I've been greeted so many different ways, I don't even know sometimes. But one and done, once a week. Who determined that spiritual growth was done at one point on a Sunday or a Friday or Thursday or a Saturday and then you just do that rinse repeat every week and that's it go in get communion drink the wine hear the sermon la da 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 praise Jesus we're done see you next week you go in give your five prayers you Praise your God, you say that you confess all this stuff, and then we just go on about our week, and then you know we'll be back for next confession. You do yoga, you feel like you're one with yourself, you feel like you're getting a good stretch in, but you're also feeling that essence of you being one with your mind and your body through the motion. Then you're good. You got your good stretch in. It's going to be nice, limber, loose, rubber goose. By the time that you come around next week, we're going off again. This isn't a good way of going about it. And the reason why is because spiritual growth is just like any other form of growth. If I told you you only got to eat once a week, would you be nourished? And a lot of shaking heads. That's a big old no. Negative. Mm -mm. You'd start. If I told you you work out once a week, you think that you're going to grow physically? If I told you you're going to school once a week, are you going to learn much? Are you going to retain information from class? You're going to come back next week ready for that test? Ready to go? Mm-mm. No. One and done once a week is the death of spiritual cultivation. This mindset of having your spiritual practice be once a week is the death of your ability to grow in the spirit. Why? Because everyone needs time one with themselves and one with the community. I have one day in my calendar that I mark 
That's fully dedicated to spirit. It's even in the name. Spirit Day! Spirit Games! Let's go be one culvert for one day. Right? Let's all go play some games. Let's all go have fun. Let's all go be buddies for a day. Let's spend one day after we all got up super early, did all our standardized tests. We're really tired, but we're feeling it. We are one culvert, tug of war, bam, let's go. Canoeing, kayaking, bam, doing awesome, warrior run. We are having fun. And afterwards, nose back to the grindstone. Got all these tests, man. It was hard. All my teachers gave me homework, even though it was spirit day. I gotta, I gotta go, man. Even the faculty are involved. It's one culver, people. That's what we're trying to do every day. When we want to be one culver, it has to be a daily thing. We need to take the time to be one, not only with ourselves, not only with our roommate, not only with our unit or dorm, not only with our battalion, with the whole school. Everyone plays a part. Everyone has obligations. Everyone's got a job to do. Not for yourself, but for the people around you. To make this all work, everyone has to do their part. And when service becomes a military obligation, when you're getting up and you gotta be at formation, you gotta be ready to go, you gotta be looking sharp, we create a lot of resentment. And that's a sad thing, because a lot of people lose sight of what we're trying to do here. When you step through those doors of the chapel, when you walk into the Toots Henderson Auditorium, when you step foot onto the yoga mat, you are one with yourself, you're one with the leader, you are one with each other. You are growing together. When students lose the value of going to service and achieving spiritual growth, in an ever secular growing world, which allows for discussion on spiritual matters outside service, I don't expect you to go do yoga every day. I know you can't just waltz into the chapel whenever you want and go do your prayers or confession, whatever you feel like you need to do. You don't have the time for that because you are at Culver. You're trying to fit a 10 pound weight in a five pound bag. It's not gonna work. We tried, it isn't. You got too much stuff. But not a single person in this room can't tell me that they don't have five minutes to take out of their day to just sit think about what happened today. You don't have to full on get crisscross applesauce on me and say in all your ohms. You can if you want, but I don't think meditation has to be that. I think meditation has to be you saying, man, why was I angry at that person today? Why did I feel so frustrated when I was talking to them? What did they say that I felt hurt by? Why was I frustrated with how I did on that test? What's the reason for me feeling this way today? I had the same exact conversation two, three days ago with my pseudo roommates over there. Because that's what spirituality is about. It's about being one culvert. It's about being there for each other. It's about making the effort. It's about understanding that you have to be one with yourself and understand. You have to allow yourself to know from an outside perspective. That is the metaphysical. Understanding yourself from the third person and why you do the things you do. That is spirituality. That's the soul. What is the emotion behind it? What is your conscience telling you? 
What's that little voice in the back of your head telling you when you get that C on a test? Is it telling you you could have been better? You didn't study hard enough. You don't deserve that. Oh, that teacher? No, they're jerk. Understanding yourself in the third person is what allows for the metaphysical and the physical realms to join. It is what allows you as a person to understand yourself fully because you see yourself through everyone else's eyes. Or you see yourself through God's eyes. That's what you believe. That's spirituality. We get so afraid of creating discomfort or offending other people when we ask those questions. Why did you feel that way? It's as simple as that. What made you feel so frustrated? What should we do? You know, I've said so much today. I've been here, there, arms all up in the air. Students who do not follow a certain religion or spiritual practice, I think, should be encouraged to find one that works for them. Now, I'm not telling you, go find everyone on campus who says they're an atheist, who doesn't want to go to service, or doesn't want to have a spiritual practice. I'm not telling you that they have to find Jesus. I'm not telling you that they have to practice meditation or yoga. I'm telling you what I just told you a couple seconds ago. The world cannot revolve around you as an individual. We cannot agree with the notion of being the center of the universe or the main character in life. Culver has no place for individuals who want to think that way. If you wanted to think that way, you shouldn't be here. Because let me tell you this, when it comes to religion as a whole, spirituality as a whole, when it comes to oneness as a group, how does being the center of the universe or the main character in your own life allowing for you to be a servant leader? The thing that Culver strives for all of us as students to be, for faculty to be. Why'd you go to LOL? Why'd you read a book about underprivileged African-American kid. His life got flipped upside down off a false accusation. Why'd you read a book about it? Why'd you want to understand perspectives from all the books you read throughout your humanities courses? Why is Culver instilling all of these ideas in you? To achieve seeing through the eyes that are not your own. To achieve understanding that is not just yours. Atheism does not equate to nihilism or complete rationalism. Existence, understood in purely material terms, is no less awesome or beautiful or meaningful. I can tell you that the world was created in seven days by God. That's pretty awesome. But I can also tell you an explosion came from nothing. Babies are born every minute, and we don't even fully understand why. We don't understand the chemical processes of why, totally. We might feel like we're getting there. But it doesn't make life any less amazing. We must encourage more open dialogue outside of service. If I can't take the time in my day, but I do, I read my Bible every day. I'm an Episcopalian, by the way, just so we got that out of the way. I read my Bible every day, but something I do even more frequently than that is talk to people about why I do it. If we're serious about any endeavor in life, we need to be both persistent and regular. This applies to spiritual growth as well. 
like I said, you can't go a week without eating people. You can't go a week without working out. You can't live in your bed all day. Culver would not expect you to go to class once a week. You're never gonna be nourished in those facets of life with the once a week attitude. When you can is the best time. One with yourself, one with the community, one with others, and seeing yourself through eyes that are not your own. Spiritual life needs to have a larger presence on campus through education and military and prefect systems. As a guy who's supposed to be the one spiritual life representative on CMA side, it can be kind of overwhelming to tell an entire core of cadets that, hey, this is kind of important. I think that spiritual life has to have place in our day-to-day -day lives. How we achieve that? We're working on it. It's in the books. But it has to be a daily thing. Why does this all matter? Spirituality affects our ability to grow and mature in thought. Our ability to connect with others on a deeper level. Our ability to reflect inwardly and judge ourselves. And our ability to determine what is right and wrong. Necessarily telling you that God has to tell you what's good and what's not good. But I guarantee you, if you punch your friend in the face, they're probably not going to like it. And it's understanding it from their perspective when they've got a bloody nose to know that, hey, that hurt. Oh, but I was mad at them. They really pissed me off. They deserved it. And you still punched them in the face. Didn't make it right. Why? Why does it matter? Because you're understanding it from their perspective. What does everybody else see? You're the guy who punched a dude in the face. That's who you are now. That's what everyone thinks you are. This is why it makes it so important when we live on this campus, when we are a community, the most important thing for all of us to understand is that as one Culver, we must always take time, whether it's one minute, one hour, whether you feel like you got to go talk to a therapist or you just got to be alone by yourself. Whatever it's gotta be, you have to find the time to reflect. I pray, I read my Bible, I emulate my life in a way that I felt that God called me to do. But I can tell you just the same about understanding how you all in this room would like me to treat you. And if I can live my life in that way, in accordance with those values, then I've done everything that I need to. I've done it the way that it needs to be done. We got the golden rule, treat everyone as they would like to be treated. Take it one step further, platinum rule. just your own. There's one thing that I want you all to take away from this, is that guys especially, I know you've heard these conversations, these little murmurs that go around on the hallways every morning on Sunday. 
maybe even Saturday night, when you hear that person down the hall saying, ugh, gotta go to church, gotta go to formation. Here we go, shave, get the ID, go check in, beep, sit down, 40 minutes, go get lunch. When you hear those conversations, do me a favor, and when you have the time, Ask them why they feel that way. Take the time. Be one culprit. So, I'll leave you all with one question. What will you do beyond the peak? Thank you all so much. Dr. Irwin's amazing brownies before the next speech starts, which deals with the idea of body image and body positivity. So that's great. Um, so if you want a brownie, you can go ahead and sit up. <laughs>